All right. Hey, guys. Thank you guys for joining me. We are going to be looking at Daniel chapter 8 today, guys. So I hope you all are out there having a great, wonderful day, guys. God is so good. God is so, so good. I tell you what. I'd appreciate if you'd send a little bit of cold air our way. I'm not going to lie about that. It's like 110 right now in New Mexico. It's been awful. But hey, I'll tell you what. Makes you want to make sure you stay in your Bible because I can promise you hell's a lot hotter than this and I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't know about nobody else, but I don't want it. I want some nice cool breeze. I don't want none of that. Not no eternity of that. No, sir. Thank you. I'm good. Or I'll be good. <laughs> all right, guys. So let's uh, let's do a little bit of prayer. And we're going to jump into Daniel chapter 8 today, all right? I love you guys. Father God, I just want to come before you today, Lord, and send my admiration, my praise, my worship up to heaven, Lord. And I want I want not just my words, Lord, but I want my life to be something that's that's a sweet smelling aroma to your throne, Lord. Something that's a that's a sacrifice that's worthwhile, something that something that lifts up the name of Christ and that lifts up you, God, and that glorifies you, Lord. Help us to be those servants that you would want us to be, God. Help us to Help us to follow you into battle. Help us to know our place and, and to be certain of what it is that you have for us, Lord. God, I thank you for this chance for us to gather together and share in your word. And I would ask that the Holy Spirit bring the remembrance to our hearts of, of previous teachings and, and just foster within us that, that appetite for you, God, and for your word and that desire to become more in-depth Christians, to have a to have a foundation that's as strong as it can possibly be and is in a foundation that is purely you, Lord. Father God, as always, I would pray for this to be a nourishment to the flock, Lord, just as I would ask for it to be able to catch the attention of anyone out there still lost to sin, still listening to the lies of the enemy, still under the perversions of the devil, Lord. We speak against that and we ask that they enjoy this video and find themselves at the foot of the cross for that beautiful transformative event that is rebirth, Lord. Um... Father God, I would pray a blood covering over the hearts and minds and a hedge of protection around the lives and bodies of children and the infirm and anyone unable to do so for themselves. God, push us forward in this day, Lord. Let us glorify you. Let us lift you up. Let us work in this great commission to do so wholeheartedly with every bit of our heart, spirit, and mind going to you, God. Thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, and the deeply personal and outward effects of salvation, Lord, in your heavenly and holy name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, guys. God is amazing, man. Come on. All right, Daniel chapter 8, guys. Well, I tell you what, I got in a frenzy writing today, and I really hope I can read my handwriting. It's real chicken scratchy, but <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I got a couple chickens outside. Maybe I can get them to translate. <laughs> All right, vision of a ram and a goat, guys, chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel. After the one that appeared to me the first time, I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there, standing beside the river, was a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, 
suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male, gr male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heavens, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast troop down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be? concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright, and he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time the end shall be. The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn, and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understand sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty, and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Amen, guys. Amen. Um, all right. So thank you guys for letting me share with you as always. Um, all right, guys. So, um, 
What a joy time in God's Word really is, guys. And as I've said before, I enjoy this time with us so much. And um, today we are blessed as we get to examine Daniel's 8th chapter. This chapter marks the book's second shift again in language. Now we are back to Hebrew. Remember, we started in Hebrew. Chapter 2 or so has shifted into Aramaic. And now we are back to Hebrew here in chapter 8, just as the book began. Before we jump into verses, though, I want to talk about a couple context points. And this second vision here was given to Daniel at the actual time of the events of the fourth and fifth chapter, that period right before Babylon fell. In fact, what Daniel, what, what is recorded here as Daniel seeing in this vision was actually key to his ability to understand the previous chapter that focused on the writing on the wall and what all that entailed. Next, and this looks heavily at this chapter's last nine verses, so like 20, 21 to 28, whatever. Um, I want to look at how we should understand these Old Testament prophets and prophecies. In our approach to biblical prophecy, it's key to keep the Old Testament prophets' point of view in our view. So how they would have seen things in our view. See, they looked forward from where they were to where we are and beyond. And see, in doing so, time sort of, as you can imagine, would converge or condense as you're looking past, right? Think about it like this. We drive towards the ocean from a distance away, and often, depending on the exact angle, we may be able to see the ocean for a long ways before we get there. But as we get closer, the details improve. And while it might have looked like it was just this and then the ocean, you realize there's all these other things in between. And see, that's how it was for them. They saw both sides of Christ's comings and were unaware of how great the time spanning was in between. Their point of view was event-oriented and not time-oriented. And so, the lack of total specificity in no way diminishes nor lessens the truth, the weight, or the impact of their words. See, we stand today in the midst of what they viewed as a singular, singular work of Christ that was sparked by sufferings and realized in an unrivaled explosion the end times of glory, love, and justice. All right, guys? So I just wanted to share that with you, kind of keep that in mind, that when you're, when you're reading the things that they're saying, they're saying them from their point of view back here, looking forward, whereas we're thinking about it with them to this side of us and the end times to this side of us. You understand? Um, all right, so let's see. Let's look at verses... 5 through 8. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him. But he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, Four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. All right, guys. So, the prophetic records in Scripture, I have to believe, are just absolutely sure to give any truly thoughtful, agnostic, or atheist absolute fits because the level of detail, the 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 level of 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 
of focus and confirmability are second to none. As Alexander the Great overwhelmed the Meadow Persians, he looted a number of Persian cities and at that point was moving directly towards India to take it as well. Now, Alexander is that goat's notable horn, but his army was tired and they were done. They said no more. They turned around, they went back to Babylon, and shortly after, at 33 years old, Alexander the Great was dead. He was feverish and he was depressed. It said that when there was nothing left to conquer before him, he wept. Alexander was so focused, so heavily on the flesh, and when you do that, your focus is on the finite, and ultimately on death itself, and we reap what we sow. Um, verse 9. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. I love that. That almost certainly has to allude, allude to, to Israel, but I love that, the glorious land. The little horn here would prove to be the Seleucid king, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, whose rule encompassed 175 to 164 B.C. This should not be confused with chapter 7, verse 8's little one. One was talking about Rome, the other one Greece. Um, let's look at verse 11, guys. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary, his, capital H, God's, sanctuary was cast down. So, the prince of hosts is God. That's what that's saying. Now we see here how Antiochus, he had done away with all godly ceremony and worship throughout Judah and Jerusalem's temple. See, in fact, he went so far as to violate the most holy place and plunder it. In fact, he went so far as to build an altar to Zeus atop God's altar, and then sacrifice pigs upon it, sickening, blasphemous, and damnable on every possible level. All right, guys, verses 15 through 17. Let's look at those. Gosh, I love sharing with you guys. Then it happened, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. So here we see the angel making clear. And here, in fact, is one of four biblical mentions of Gabriel. His name means either God is mighty or mighty one of God. Either way, an impressive name. Daniel responds to this vision like many others throughout time did with sheer terror, followed by a direct fall onto one's face. All right, guys, let's look at verses 23 through 25, and I'm going to close on this, but I've got a whole bunch to share on it. So let's look at 23 through 25. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty, and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many 
in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. All right, guys. So, here the vision and its focus jumps ahead in its focus in time. This little growing horn is fulfilled in Antiochus. Now, Alexander was power hungry and driven, and Antiochus was cruel. And when you combine those two together, you have an inkling of what the Antichrist and who the Antichrist is. In fact, verses 21 through 25 point out some key characters, well, actually, really mostly 23 through 25, point out some key characteristics of this wicked one who would dare to oppose the Lord Jesus. And this is the Antichrist. And so, these are some things that the Antichrist will be and will do. Okay? Verse 23 points out that the Antichrist will be dramatic in appearance, will be destined to do evil, and will be a dynamic leader. So think about that, all right? Verse 24. The Antichrist will wield demonic power, and his reign will be characterized by destruction. I'm not saying that he will characterize his reign by destruction, but to those who are willing to discern what they see, they will see that his reign will be characterized by destruction. Now, verse 25 points to something else the Antichrist will be. He will be one who has deceitful practices. All right? Now, also, verse 25 points to how he will deify himself. He will seek to deify himself, and he will disguise his evil and cruelty with promises of peace. In fact, we're told that the devil will come in the appearance of an angel of light. So know that, that the Antichrist, everything he's selling will sound good. He will be a high-energy person. He will have the appearance of one who just wants to bring everybody together and, and, and have a peaceful outcome. But the fruit, the fruit won't be there, guys. And see, thankfully, his efforts are all for naught. Because in verse 25, as well as Revelation chapter 19, verses 19 through 20, are clear that he will be destroyed. And not by us. He will be destroyed by God. He will be destroyed by the supernatural and divine power of God Almighty. And there ain't nothing that they can do about it, guys. The victory is ours. All right? And we have to walk in that. We've got to walk in that. We've got to, we've got to believe in that. That is our hope. See, people in the world, they hope for things that they're not sure that they would ever get. That's why they hope for them. No, no, no. Not us. We hope for what we know is ours. We hope for it in that we hope for that time to come because what a glorious time it will be when all this is done and the new heaven arises, right? All right, guys. Hey, if you're not subscribed, man, smash that subscribe button and drop a new video like this six days a week. And guys, if you can put up with me, I promise Father God wants us to be in his word. He wants us to read his word. He wants us to... Think about his word, pray about his word, take the things that we learn, plug it into our lives, guys, and walk it out every day. He says that he wants doers of the word, not just hearers. All right. Um, give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Share it if you loved it. If you have any prayer requests, any comments, anything like that at all, guys, drop that down here into the comment section, man. Guys, I love you so much. Father God loves you even more, man, all right? So check it out. Whatever y'all do, go out there, have a blessed day, and know this. Jesus loves you guys so much, man. So much. He went to the cross for us, and he knows. He knows all the ways we've already messed up, and he knows all the ways we're going to mess up in the future. He knows all those awful things that we would never even say out loud. He knows them. He still went to the cross for us, guys. So think about that. And when you see somebody else out there 
And you will, because the world is filled with people who are struggling. Let them know the same. Let them know how much Jesus loves them. Because maybe nobody else has ever told them. Or maybe they just need to hear it today, guys. Because it can make all the difference. I love you guys.